everyone. Thank you so much for joining us online for tonight's event. This panel discussion on different versions of home is part of a series of programs we are presenting this fall to celebrate the Asian American Writers Workshop's 30th anniversary. We're calling this series and campaign AAWW at 30 and we'll be announcing the final two events in the series early next week, so please stay tuned. My name is Lily Philpott. I'm the programs manager at the Asian American Writers Workshop, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual event space. Please do say hi. Let us know in the chat where you're watching from. I am speaking to you all from Brooklyn, New York, which is on ancestral and unceded Canarsie and Munsee Lenape land. For those of you who are new to the AAWW in our 30th year, we are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to uplifting Asian diasporic literature and storytelling. We hold frequent conversations like this one, organize community arts programming in New York City, run fellowship programs for emerging writers of color, and publish an award-winning online literary magazine, The Margins. Our retrospective series, AAWW at 30, is exploring the values and ideas that lie at the heart of the workshop's mission. From the complexities of representation to the need for an artistic home, which we'll discuss tonight, to interrogating our editorial and archival legacies, this series of events will serve not only as a retrospective for our rich and layered history, but also as a resounding call to envision our future. Programs like this wouldn't be possible without the support of our community. You can donate to support many more years of the workshop and all of our programs at the link in the Zoom chat. And we hope you'll join us online this fall. You can also join us at aaww.org or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube where the recording of this event will be posted. During tonight's event, we ask that all audience members practice nonviolence in the chat. Comments that are racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, and or misogynist will be flagged and the person will be removed from this event. We will have time for audience Q&A towards the end of the hour and you can ask your questions via the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. I am going to introduce our panelists and welcome them on screen as I do so and then we'll turn the metaphorical mic over to Kathy Lin Che who will moderate our conversation. Jeffrey Udin was appointed executive director of the AAWW in January 2020. She is the first woman to lead the organization since its founding in 1991. With over a decade of experience working in the public sector, she specializes in communications, education, and fundraising. She most recently served as deputy director of development for special events with PEN America, and she regularly volunteers her time with a number of literary and social change organizations. She serves as chair of the Adult Internship Committee for We Need Diverse Books and as a literary council member for the Brooklyn Book Festival. Lawrence Min Bui Davis, PhD, is curator of Asian Pacific American Studies at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. He serves as the lead organizer for the Asian American Literature Festival and is a co-founder of the Pop-Up Center for Refugee Poetics. He is also the founding director of the Arts Anti-Profit, the Asian American Literary Review, and editor-in-chief of its literary journal. He is currently ranked as the ninth best ice cream maker in human history. Tningda Sor co-founded The Juggernaut, a site and newsletter dedicated to South Asian news. She serves as CEO and has raised over 1 million from investors, including Y Combinator and 8VC's Bhaskar Ghosh. The juggernaut subjects range from Kashmiri American activism to the legacy of India's first female pilot. And our moderator, Kathy Lin Che, is the author of Split, winner of the Kundiman Poetry Prize, the Norma Farber First Book Award from the Poetry Society of America, and the Best Poetry Book Award from the Association of Asian American Studies. Her work has been published in The New Republic, The Nation, McSweeney's, and Poetry Magazine. She has received awards from McDowell, Sewanee Writers Conference, Jurassic, and more. She's taught at the 92nd Street Y, New York University, Fordham University, and Sierra Nevada College, where she was the Distinguished Visiting Professor and Writer in Residence. She is currently a PhD student in English at Fordham University, and she serves as Executive Director at Kundiman and lives on the traditional lands of the Lenape people. My colleague Ashwarya posted links to each of the organizations that our panelists represent in the chat, and we do hope you will follow those and learn more about their work if you are not already familiar with them. Kathy, over to you.
Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I was wondering, um, so we'll begin the conversation just by giving some context, even though we heard the bios, maybe people can speak up a little bit since we are all um, people who organize Asian American communities and Asian American writer communities. I wanted to ask just, um, what do you do in your work to create home for Asian Americans or you know, a more sub specific subset of Asian Americans? And I'll just call on people and they can answer. And if you don't feel ready, you can just always pass. And just also audience members that you can also respond to that. Um, you know, what do you do um, to nurture Asian American voices, whether it be your own or other people? So. I'm gonna start with um, Jeffreen, since you're hosting us AAWW at 30, maybe you can just introduce um, a little bit of your work. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. Thank you all for being here. Thank audience members. Um, really excited for the conversation. Um, so as Lily mentioned in my bio, I'm the executive director of the Asian American Writers Workshop. Um, and you know we're celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. And from the founding, our organization has been rooted in the idea of um, creating home and a community that feels like home um, for Asian American storytellers. And so, you know, at the workshop, we do this in a number of different ways. We um, obviously host public programs and conversations like this one tonight. Um, we have fellowship programs where cohorts of writers every year, um, you know, not only gain material support and mentorship and stipends and, and, and that kind of support from the organization, but also, you know, find home in each other and create a community amongst themselves um, as a cohort and with past cohorts. Um, and we also uh, work with um, the New York City community by placing teaching artists in high schools and senior centers. So for us, you know, creating home is, is really tied very explicitly to creating community. Um, it's driven everything that we've done since our founding and, and that we continue to do today. Thanks, Jeffrey. That's really, um, that's really comprehensive and beautiful. Um, Lawrence, did you wanna chime in? Uh, sure, first, um, thank you for having me <clears throat> to the workshop and thank you, Kathy, always lovely to see you. Uh, I wanted to say I'm calling in from Piscataway lands with gratitude to for being a guest here and quick uh, visual description. I'm wearing glasses. I have dark hair. Um, I generally have a befuddled expression on my face. I'm wearing a green coffee supply shirt. Um, I'm male presenting. Um, let's see. I think my kids are calling me in the background right now to say good night. I will hang up on them because it's a new program. It demands your world famous ice cream. Yeah, I don't like my ice cream is in grace. Um, okay. How? <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Yeah, I hear my son going, hi, dad, in the background. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, how do I create home? So I work at the Smithsonian, the Asian Pacific American Center. Um, you know, our Smithsonian is our, is, is, the Smithsonian. It's the largest museum complex in the world. Um, I work on programs and initiatives that I like to think center trust and work. You know, there's like specific things that we do or kind of thematics or kinds of work that we do, but I really like to think about co-ownership and community governance being at the center of what I do as I'm working with writers and organizations and supporting and nurturing our arts communities. I think of home as a place of, or ideally a place of shared decision-making and trust. Um, I think also uh, mentioning the frame of the Smithsonian, I think of the Smithsonian as an institutional space that is, that is definitively not a home, or that is a flagship national institution that stands in for an America, as I think we'll be talking about plenty tonight, that is not a home for many people of color, including, including our um, Asian American um, communities all across the country, our Asian diasporic communities. And so I have spent a lot of time thinking about what does it mean to be in this massive white dominant um, colonial history belated um, 
institution and how to create something approximating a home or kind of ephemeral home spaces within it, how to, how to, how to pull resources from it and create possibility out of it, but how to make it livable for myself and make it maybe temporarily, liv temporarily livable for other people. Yeah, just reading a couple things from the chat. Thank you, Lawrence, so much. Um, just mentioning that um, Lily pulled out a quote, home as a place of shared decision-making and trust. And Lily saying that's beautiful. And just um, also reading out in the chat, Lucy Yao saying, what a great question. I realized that nurturing Asian American, vo nursing, nurturing American voices starts when you begin to believe that your story matters and to share and listen and check in with others. So thank you so much, Lucy, for that. And um, Stigna, could you perhaps talk a little bit more about the question of, um, you know, what do you do in your work to create home for Asian Americans? Thanks so much. I'm so sorry. I'm from I'm at this coffee shop because they already know, but I got locked up in my office. So apologies for the ambient noise. When I think of home, I often, I, you know, specifically to give a bit more context to the juggernaut, we focus on the South Asian diaspora around the world. And we also focus on South Asian stories. And when I think about home, for me, it's that feeling that you're getting like a warm, big brown hug and you don't have to be South Asian. You can be from any community, any background, um, any perspective, but do you have a shared sense of curiosity and an ability to be inquisitive and care? And that's what home means to me when you're part of a group of people that make you feel safe and held and they're curious about you and they're curious about your story. And I've always found home when those things are true. And that those are, that's what we try to make sure our community feels as well. Yeah, thank you so much. The, I, I love the big hug, big warm hug and curiosity as a component of just sort of entering that home space. It's kind of like whenever, you know, you know what it's like to enter a space where you feel welcomed and you know what it's like to enter a space or I know what it's like to enter a space where, you know, you, you feel shut out. So that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, you know, I was just thinking about the concept of home. It can be such a fraught term within Asian American communities. Um, um, part of it is, um, the the question of inclusion and I do think of you know for me I think there's different ways of understanding the idea of Asian American so there's one which is you know demographic right um, you know people identify I don't even know if it's about self identifying as much as that there's you know a kind of like idea of people um, being slotted in a checkbox, a racial category. Um, and then there's this other idea of, you know, what, where Asian American is not necessarily this uh, demographic category, but more of a coalitional identity that was, is, you, you know, you opt into, you choose. And the, ch the choice is a very political choice. Um, but even so, the way that Asian America, and I think a lot about, um, sometimes it's like to whom, right? Like who are you legible to as an Asian American and what comes with that? So what does it mean to create a home with Asian American people, uh, folks who I self identify as, as such? And, you know, for people who are, you know, my parents are refugees from Vietnam. So, you know, home for them is very, you know, it's many, many places and no place in some ways. And so, there's also folks who are just in general, in general diasporic being, you might have many homes, you might have been uh, of this or multiple homes and that's just something you have to contend with. And for me, just sort of when I visit Vietnam, sometimes I'm like, there's a deep grief and mourning in coming home, even though I was born in the US. And then there's also this um, sense that I'm so American, you know, there's, there's just a lot of um, fraught feelings that come with home, I think. So I'm just wondering, you know, how have you and your organizations thought about this 
fraughtness within Asian America. Um, and also, you know, of course, uh, when we think politically about Asians coming to the US and, you know, when we talk about, you know, providing a land acknowledgement, you know, that's like an aspect. Um, the ways that Pacific Islander communities are um, sometimes um, kind of erased and displaced. Um, so there's a lot to sort of mull over or think through. So if anybody wanted to talk a little bit about that question, just the fraughtness um, and how have you and your organizations thought about this? I'll drop this in. And yeah, if anybody wants to jump in, you can do it. I can also just call out. I'm just happy to jump in a little bit. Um, yeah. uh, one, one of the first things that came to mind with this prompt was, was actually your book, Kathy, and um, the ways in which it um, thinks about sexual violence. And I think when we hold up home, at, like there's a, there's a, a rush to romanticize it, we need home as a kind of arts idea, but also mm -hmm. so many of us know that home and families are spaces of violence, sexual mm -hmm. violence and domestic violence. And so using it as a metaphor is, is, a, is a fraught endeavor. Um, and then also, I think all of us are, you know, deeply steeped, especially in these past, you know, two years of um, COVID and anti-Asian violence of thinking about model minoritization and thinking about how the home is a kind of um, a cell or a unit within a kind of larger capitalist country where the forces of model, model minoritization don't just start out in the world, they start at home. They press down upon families and make demands on what survival looks like and what performance of identity, including racial identity, has to look like and often resulting in tremendous intergenerational trauma that so many of our um, artists and writers spend so much time thinking about and trying to make sense of and trying to to create healing spaces um, across generations for. So um, yeah, I think the work of our organizations, I don't think any of us have a, a great sense of how to continually grapple with all of these problems with home, um, but to create, to continually try to create homes that um, are alive and awake to these kinds of violence and mm -hmm. that um, rather than pretending they don't exist um, looking to deal with them directly especially in the last few years I think our organizations have really turned towards thinking more about um, our relationship to indigenous communities as you mentioned our, our status as settlers to thinking about disability justice to thinking about gender justice not just in a broad sense but in a very immediate process oriented sense within our organizations and how we function um, so, yeah, I, I, I can say more about, you know, within my specific orgs, but that, that was a kind of starting point for me. Yeah, thanks, Lawrence, for sharing that. I, that gave me inspiration for my answer because I was a little bit stuck initially, but I think in terms of a lot of the things you touched on, um, especially for South Asians, it's so funny because there's, I mean, Jeffrey also knows this. There's so much litigation over even the names we call for our homes. There's litigation over, do we call it South Asian? Do we call it Brown? Do we call it Basie? And then there's wrong, and some people consider it wrong answers for even each of those. And going back to having an ancestral home, specifically, so many people do come from places of trauma. I personally, my family is a partition family, which means ancestrally, my family is from what is now Bangladesh, but we lost our home. And so, when people are like, oh, you're Indian. I'm like, yes, I'm Indian, but I also identify as Bengali. I also identify, you know, generally as South Asian. I also identify as, I was born in a, by the way, even personally, I was born in a state in India that didn't exist. Like I was born in a state called Madhya Pradesh that changed into Chhattisgarh. So like so many of things of, you know, when we think about home is just so litigated in the South Asian community. And so going back to the first definition that you asked us, Kathy, like what is home? It, I do wanna make sure that people feel safe. And so for us as a community, it's always important that people feel like they can self-identify. And I also think it's important to use the phrase that we think is the least contentious because you know some people don't like the word they see. It has other 
signifiers and things like that. So how do we avoid some of those words if they can offend someone or, or displace someone? Um, so I think about that a lot, which is people should be allowed to self-identify. And it could be that they opt out of the coalition. It could be that they opt out of identity altogether. And that's their choice. And all we can do is just center our stories and hope, and it's a big tent and people are welcome to come in and you know they're welcome to visit or they're welcome to stay. Beautiful. Um, Jeffrey, do you have thoughts? Yeah, no, I'm just gonna add, I mean, uh, echoing, you know, kind of everything that um, Lawrence and Snigda said, uh, what I'll add is I think for us at the workshop, um, we talk about this a lot, um, in different ways and at the root of it is is being okay with sitting in tension right and like asian american is a tense term that what is asian american right and like what does it entail what does it mean for certain people um instead of you know either avoiding that conversation or romanticizing it um you know kind of holding that discomfort a little bit and just understanding that it is tense i think is a big piece of of you know at least having the conversation um thinking about home also you know for diasporic communities like what does it mean when your you know your home country is is one that upholds casteism and ethnic based violence and you know at at multiple levels you know what is what tension does that add um when you're identifying with, um, you know, your, your country of origin or where your parents are from or whatever that may be. Um, and, and what home means for you, um, in that context. So that's not to say that, um, I think holding tension is just critical, um, for the workshop, you know, you ask kind of what we do, what, how we think about it. We always operate from as radically inclusive of an ethos as possible. Um, and, and I think it's really important for organizations to be deliberate and intentional about that. You know, we, and, and it can be easy to, um, turn conversations like that into a numbers game. How many people do you have from this community? How many people do you have from that community? Um, I think there's a way to be inclusive and, and be deliberate about, making sure that as many communities are represented without being reduced to tokenism. Um, it's not easy, but it's, um, I think it requires a, a lot of, of deliberate intention that we try to approach all of our work with. Yeah, it's very fascinating, the idea of, um, you know, somebody, like Ashvarya at the root of it is being okay with sitting in tension. I don't know that everybody's always comfortable with tension because I think um, I just know a lot of people who self-identify as Asian American and maybe myself included. Let's, you know, let's be real. I don't, I don't like when my friends fight, you know, I, I don't like, I don't mind kind of uh, complex discourse, but there is something about, um, the desire, you know, to um, sort of feel like we are we are one, we are together. This is a coalition. We're in solidarity. That I think sometimes can um, potentially sort of mean that we're not honestly and earnestly sort of having a, a op as open a conversation as possible. Yeah, Jeffrey. Yeah. No, I totally hear that. I think you know, not to be a, a curmudgeon that hates the internet, but like, ah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> but I think one thing that has happened because of like, you know, internet outrage, Twitter outrage or whatever is there's no room for like nuance, right? You're either like, everything's cheerful and great and wonderful. And we're all on the same team or you're evil and violent. And like, I can't even be in the same room as you, right? We, we, we like, retreat to these opposite ends of the spectrum. And I think a big piece of being able to sit in tension is like leaving room for nuance and, you know, it's okay to disagree. It's okay to fight, but not letting ourselves kind of resort to this, like the, like the internet outrage of, you know, we either agree on everything or, or you're, you know, the devil incarnate. Yeah, the devil. 
You know? <laughs> what do you do with the devil? Hey, good questions <laughs> to think about. But um, no, thanks for that, Jeffrey. I mean, we don't want to be, you know, you know, us v internet, uh, but you know, it's good to comment on the internet. It's such a powerful force. Um, so yeah, the next question I have, and thanks, thanks, uh, well, Giles, for the uh, the purple heart in the chat. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, just wondering how can writing or how does in your, you know, what we do, all of us, we write and we also support writers, we nurture writers. How does writing create this home space for Asian Americans? And, it, you know, it's very fraught because, you know, I, you know, at Kundiman where we, we will sit in a circle and then I remember specifically there's a writer, Amy Lamb was like, I just can't, you know, there's, there's a lot of conversations around it, but I, it just, you know, she said like, it fucks me up just writing in English at all. You know, she's like um, Chinese, Vietnamese, like families, um, ethnically Chinese, but from Vietnam. It's like, and yeah, like Gina Postol was also kind of mentioning that, but, you know, but we, uh, many of us, you know, not all, but many of us write in English, but what does, that's, that's a side bar, right? But how can writing or literature create a home space for Asian Americans? Um, we're not a home space, like, let's be real with their, like, language, yeah. Um, yeah, does anybody want to jump in that, into that? I can try to jump in initially, but, you know, one of the reasons, you know, we created the juggernaut was exactly to find this home space via writing and storytelling, so it's kind of interesting the way the question is framed, and I think many immigrants, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but for me as an immigrant, I was born in India and came to America when I was three. The way I learned Americana was doing the Matilda move of going to the public library every week and taking out, you know, 25 books at a time. Like, I didn't know anything about the significance of Agatha Christie or any of those kind of Western canon people until I like consumed them and as literature. And, it, you know, even going through you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, and so much of your sense of self is determined by the media you consume, whether it is literature, writing, um, movies, videos, TV shows, and to go through all of that and to often not have a full sense of yourself. Like I always knew, I had this inkling of the things that felt like home. Like I was always drawn, drawn to magical realism. Like I would always love Borges and Marquez and uh, Salman Rushdie's like Midnight Children. I, I can never really explain why. I was always drawn to Bollywood. I love that escapism and suspension of belief. And then only in college when I actually read the texts of how Bollywood came to be and learning how our literature has just been excised from history. You know, the other day somebody, I read a tweet that said Hindi was a modern language that was invented 70 years ago and I almost like spat into my coffee. I was like, what? <laughs> like, you know, this like framing of our cultures is often like moot and erased as you talked about. And so rediscovering that and al allowing us and everybody among our freelance network to have that platform to share stories that go often missing, um, don't get told, don't get told from a brown lens or a brown gaze. I really do think that it's such a powerful way to make it feel like home. So I don't know, I feel strongly about that question. So I'm glad you asked. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Does somebody else want to jump in? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I'm thinking about this in terms of um, <clears throat> like writing and literature as not just being the page, like the ways in which we think about visual art being beyond the kind of white cube gallery and the object, but like what about the the, the kind of the human being and the imagination that went that and the labor that went into the to, to kind of the physical object in this case like I've been thinking so much about writing and literature as process and not just that pro that final product that publication uh, I think I, I, I've worried a lot that I think a lot of us have worried that over the years especially for Asian American literature or Asian or, or you know literatures by people of color that um, they become um, commodified by a publishing industry 
who doesn't have a vested interest in literature serving a certain kind of social or humanizing function for our communities. And so stewardship, which is maybe a different way of thinking about home and homemaking and home building and home tending um, and the, the kind of like environment of home and of our communities, like can't be left to publishing houses that are fundamentally commercial in nature and that may be filled with very good people and some not good people sometimes, but as institutions are not structured to have a function that we need them to have. And so they need correctives or they can only be one part of a larger ecosystem. And so it is our responsibilities to nurture not just what gets to the page and what people read or to have book groups and have people read together, but to think about literature more expansively as a set of dynamics, as the many complex things that go into creating what lands on the page, but also how we make meaning of it and how we interpret it and how it um, um, kind of becomes magic in a, in a larger kind of circuit of feeling and thinking and exchange. Those are, I think, where all of our organizations do so much work that is often invisibilized that is kind of home building, that is, that is necessary creating support. I mean, there's so many writers that will trace their livelihoods and their trajectories to meeting the right person at the workshop at a reading in you know, 1995. Or I'm sure the juggernaut has connected so many people that um, who's, it just changes, just bends the arc of their careers, working with the right editor or making the right friend or writing a piece that led to more pieces. And obviously Kundiman has been a really important home for Asian American literature in that sense, not simply as a, it's not a publishing organ, right? So what is its function in the community? It's not publishing directly per se, but it's had such a huge influence on what's been published over the last five, 10 years, longer than that, obviously. Um, so so yeah, I, I'm thinking about how we create a home has so much to do with processes beyond beyond the, beyond what's on the page, beyond craft conversations. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to say something that um, that that makes me think about is just sort of writing not on the page because both of you um, mentioned not just you know writing on the page meet but other forms of um, sort of, uh, yeah, uh, reflection of how we understand ourselves. And I was just thinking about um, just, you know, what brought me to writing was really my parents' stories told around the kitchen table. And that feels so urgently, that feels like literature, that feels like writing, even if it's not always honored as such. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, Jeffrey. Yeah, no, I, to, to kind of add on to what Lauren's kind of, you talked about, you know, commodification. I think a big piece of that or kind of combating that is, you know, do writers have the freedom to tell the story that they want to tell? You know, not the one that they think they have to tell because they are the brown writer or they're the Muslim writer or whatever. And so much of that is like, who are you writing for? And us at the workshop, we think a lot about, um, you know, making sure that our, our community of writers, you know, feel liberated to tell the story that they want to tell to the audience that they want to tell it to. Um, so when I think about, you know, the, why literature is important um, in terms of, um, you know, the context of home, I think a big piece of it is just the, the, the freedom and liberty that comes from being able to tell your own story on your own terms. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, that's kind of from the writer's perspective. And then from the reader's perspective, you know, on the flip side, you know, I, I think there are, it, it's a conversation that can be reduced and, and, and um, can be, re you know, reduced to tokenism and, and, and all of that. But I do think there is power in representation um, and it's, it's worth mentioning, right? I think that it is really, you know, I love when there's some like obscure piece of Bollywood news that only I know about and like the juggernaut's on it. The juggernaut has written about it, right? And it, there's like, there's like a, a, a piece of like comfort that comes when you're like scrolling on Twitter and like this like obscure kind of like celebrity gossip thing that you thought no one else would know about, but like 
here's a publication that is acknowledging that I, that that kind of feeling of comfort and and what it means to to be represented in like mainstream media, whatever that is, um, I think can be powerful and is 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 worth at least like acknowledging. Jeffrey, I wanted to take a thread you said that was so powerful to me was. Um, do you have the power to tell the stories you want to tell? And I think I'm seeing this in the publishing industry a bit. I'm not as close to it as AAWW, but how, if you are South Asian or if you are Indian American, you're expected, like you're, there's like somebody tweeted about this, like there can only be one great Indian novel a year. Like wh how ridiculous is that? You know, in, 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 from a culture that has billions of people walking the world or you know you can't have only one vietnamese story a year like that just seems insane and it seems like if you are indian Amer a successful indian american writer you have to write at least one great indian american novel or something like that and i remember i had the privilege of interviewing riz ahmed who's a noted actor but he's also a rapper and musician and activist and we had a really deep conversation on, on culture what is culture and he says you know i feel like i'm stretching culture and i asked him what does that mean when you stretch culture and he told me something that I could never forget. It means that when you can depict exactly your own story, but also walk miles in somebody else's story and do justice to both with equal grace. And I think his decision to you know, both play characters that are not things he's experienced, but also play a Muslim man. And he's like, I wanna be able to do both with grace. And I was like, yes, you should have the freedom to do both with grace. And so I love that you said that, Jeffrey. And I just want to underline that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I know there's a good number of audience questions. Um, so I'm, I have one final question and we'll just do a, a little, you know, bloop bloops, like, you know, coming around and it is geared toward the audience. And um, I am, you know, um, just thinking about the audience, you know, there's a lot of questions about audience, first of all. Like, I, I like the ideas that you both mentioned about power and um, this is off the question a little bit, but power and this idea of scarcity and who are you writing to? And when do you know when you have a story to tell and who's gonna value it? Um, how do you know that it is a value of worth or something like that, you know? and how do you navigate multiple audiences when you think about like who you're intending toward? So that's something, something, <laughs> this is why I can't write a paper because I keep like bloop, bloop, the, the bubbles keep happening. But um, so that's something we will discuss, can discuss or think about. But my question is also um, just about how, how do people, what advice do you have for people who don't feel like they have a place where they belong or, and what are some tools for creating a space for themselves or for others? Um, yeah, anybody wanna jump in? Um, my first piece of advice would be to come to Asian American Writers Workshop events. <laughs> Great. Because I promise you, you will feel like you belong. Um, no, I think, I, I think it's hard. I mean, you know, I, um, I think for writers, finding, finding your, your community of writers, your support is so important. Um, I don't know that I have actual advice aside from um, knowing that your community is out there and, and not kind of getting disheartened at the lack of it. I think, I think we think a lot about when we do our programming of like, you know, the high school kid in like the middle of the country who maybe doesn't have access to like a, a broader Asian American diaspora community. Like, what does it mean for someone like that to kind of stumble across our offerings and, and our programs? And um, we've had multiple community members who have spoken at length about how, even when they weren't in New York City, you know, they felt connected to our community of writers and readers, just knowing that we were there, keeping up with our events, keeping up with our program. So um, I don't know if this is good advice and it might not be that helpful, but um, I would say that, you know, your, your community is out there. It's, it, you know, it might be harder to find for some than others. Uh, 
I have a question. Um, sure. Answering question with a question. Um, uh, Sneda, can you talk about founding the Juggernaut a little bit? Yeah, I can. Um, what would you like to know, Lawrence? What's like the most helpful for this audience? Is it like why I wanted to why I wanted to start it, or what I saw in the community and what it was lacking? Um. Yeah, maybe closer to the second, and then a little bit of like nuts and boltsy for like somebody who's like, I feel this thing, this need, like you're describing, and then how do I go from the need to, like, you know, the juggernaut now is very far from that originary moment, but like, how do you, like, what's the, the most important in the community, the first steps that somebody that finds themselves with that need and wanting to create a necessary venue or space? Yeah, like, that's... No, thank you for asking that question. I think that's a wonderful question. I have a hypothesis that every single person can be a founder or creator of something, right? We all know that. We all have a lived experience that's so unique to us that we see a specific problem that nobody else might be seeing or experiencing in the same way. And so the first step for me is recognizing that I had a problem, right? Which is like, oh, I don't feel fully myself. I don't feel fully realized. I don't see myself when I scroll through the New York Times app or the Wall Street Journal app or any of these Twitter feeds. I don't see the stories that I grew up with. And that's a problem. And then the second step is, are there more of you like out there, right? And so I tried to test it the cheapest way I possibly could. I started a MailChimp list and I didn't pay for the MailChimp at the time. And I started sending it to, I think, a hundred of my closest friends and said, if you like it, please spread the word. And before I knew it, I think there was a point where I didn't know more than half of the people on the list. So when you get those strangers who share that problem or who share that passion, and our open rates were really high. And then people were starting to ask me, how are you doing this during your free time when you're busy? Because I was doing this while I had a full-time job. And I think, you know, for me, that's kind of how I built that, which is like recognizing problem in myself, identifying it, finding the contours, figuring out a really easy and cheap and free way to test it, finding others and building community around that, and then seeing how far I can push it. So that was kind of the beginning of how it happened. And I don't know if that's helpful to people today, but you know, I know there's now so many easier kind of mechanisms that even I had. I know there's Substack, there's Patreon, there's so many ways to figure out if there's a community out there. Um, but I don't know if that was helpful, Lawrence, but let me know if, what, what I can dig deeper on. Yeah, totally. I wrote in the chat, like, I love the idea that all of us are capable of being founders. I feel like, um, we need to keep saying that and it's important to hear that to like um to, to like I, I hope that most of us have that feeling deep down but it, it does take that pushing and i think about like in relationship to the, the workshop 30 years ago like you know like it's a simple technology of going to a, i think it you know it was a a greek restaurant um that like curtis and um uh, Marie Lee and, and Bino and, and the other kind of core group at the beginning just like sat down together and started sharing and then got in buses like or getting in a van and driving to a college and giving a poetry reading of Asian American poetry is not like expensive or require any amazing tech or like it's just like the daring and the like the wanting to do it and I think like what you're talking about how you describe starting the juggernaut it like is less daunting when you explicate like well these are the kind of the 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 very simple origins, but it does require that basic belief in like, oh, I can be a founder. I can have that energy, especially if I just think about like the need and the problem and understand it. Um, and, you know, as you know, having founded a, an, an, an arts nonprofit went through a kind of similar process, but then also on the other hand, working at a massive institution like the Smithsonian is like the opposite end of like trying to carve out space in a big institution. And I think it's such, we have such cultural trend, like there is a need for that, or obviously I work there. So I believe there's a need for that to be in federal spaces or large foundations and to, um, you know, crack the doors open. But there's also at the same time, such a need for like the cultural treasures of our own self-created um, community oriented and based and grounded um, institutions and organizations that are not large high level government run and full of bureaucracy and then therefore white dominant and um, 
instead are kind of built from the ground up and immediately accountable to our communities that that they're um so necessary and so beautiful but like like you said like they start with that kind of simplicity of idea of need um and for those like who are asking this question i think like you feel that need in the geographic space or whatever space that you are are in like to to reach out to others to to recognize that problem and to to kind of co-create community to find other like-minded folks and it's it is really can be that simple um yeah yeah thank you um so we're gonna move into the q a session but i do have one thing that was directed specifically at me and it was a question about um how do you know when you that your voice is um, worthwhile? How do you know that you, you have a story to tell? And you know, Lawrence referenced um, I wrote my first book um, in large part about sexual violation, childhood sexual violation, and it was um, very challenging to know at that time if it was a story worth telling. So I remember asking this question in my creative writing workshop, I said, what is telling and what is art? How do I understand the difference between it? And, um, you know, my friend Soma Sharif, who was in that workshop, it was, it was um, wrote a poem in response. And so a pull out of that poem is simply this, so often the telling is good enough is all I have the mouth willing to open to its own surprise. So that's the Somaza's gift to me and also therefore a gift to you, Lucy. So, you know, just write it and tell it and you might surprise yourself. Um, so with that, um, let's move to Q&A. Lily, do you wanna do that? Yeah. Thank you all so much for this conversation. Thank you for um, bringing Salmaz's words into this space as well, Kathy. It was, that is beautiful to hear. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience that I will read out and everyone can hop in and respond to. To everyone who's watching, if you have questions you'd like our speakers to discuss, please do add them um, in the chat or the Q&A function. We will catch them in either place. So the first question is from Anju. And it is, do you think home can look different to Asian Americans versus Asian American immigrants? I feel they experience home and they experience racism differently. I'd like to start us off. I, I mean, yes, right? And it's, it's a different experience. It's a different lived experience. It's, there are overlaps for sure, it, you know, our, our work and, and the way we think about the Asian American community, it's, you know, it's intergenerational, it's transnational, it's as intersectional as, as we can be. And um, a big piece of that is, is kind of understanding the different lived experiences, even within, you know, one community. And it, it goes back a little bit to what we were talking about of, you know, the, the tension of the big tent of Asian America, like even forgetting the split between kind of immigrant and American born. I mean, even among immigrant communities, there are multitudes of lived experiences. There's no one Asian American immigrant experience either, right? Um, so, I mean, the short answer, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else wanna to respond to that question? I just have a specific uh, underline to what Jeffrey said so well, which is there's a phrase I often say to myself for every story, there's another story. Um, so for example, there was, you know, there's that stereotype of several Asian American immigrants experience of, you know, opening up that quote unquote smelly lunch at the at, at lunchtime. And I remember there's a beautiful essay on Eater where somebody said, actually, that wasn't my experience. And I think that's the beauty of storytelling which is that, hey, for every story, there's another story. And we can all exist in all those multitudes and celebrate that. And so I always say whenever people feel not heard or not seen or not written about, like share it, share it so that we can see that other side. Thank you so much for that, Sinta. 
Um, I actually feel like this leads us really well into our second question, um, which is sort of directed to the writers among you, which is, in your writing, do you feel you have to navigate among several audiences? And if so, how do you do that in terms of writing for your community, knowing that other people are going to read it once the piece, whatever it might be, leaves your hands? I mean, I can speak to this a little bit. As a poet, um, I was writing really before I had ever been published to myself to come to understand things. And then when it was being published, I think guessed my, and I really was insistent that, you know, I didn't want to translate it in poetry. You got a lot of freedom, right? Um, <laughs> you can do, you can fuck around, You're, do whatever you want. So I didn't want to translate any Vietnamese. I wanted the person that, aim was to be somebody who had my exact subject position and that person would have the greatest access and anybody else can peer in but that wasn't I didn't want to explain or translate to anybody even on the kind of like literal level I didn't want to translate my mother's funny phrase the person who would get it you know sometimes that there's like a Vietnamese person in the audience and they get it and that's really rewarding I'd actually love to ask this question specifically to Snigda as well, in terms of the writers who contribute to the juggernaut and whether, um, I mean, they're doing sort of more straight journalism, but are there sort of tips you give them in terms of addressing your audience? Yeah, I love that question. I loved also what Kathy said about choosing not to translate sometimes. So one of the um, kind of style guides we took on very early on is that we do not italicize words that are not in English because, you know, why do we do that? Why do we do that in like American English? Why do we italicize words? What's really fascinating about the English language is that it absorbs so many words. So it's just chance that tsunami is not italicized, but it could be. And so, you know, one of those, these are one of the things we do. The second thing we notice is that South Asia specifically is so diverse. So sometimes people are tempted to kind of write it in the you know the language and we say definitely do that for for people who who can understand and also just to make it more accessible to folks across the board especially in the diaspora we then just put the translation of you know the english of a hindi phrase from a bollywood song or something and i think that's just important to be accessible so i would say we we are very very cognizant that we can never encompass the entire diversity of south asia that's the tldr but what we can do is keep getting better and keep amplifying voices that are often not at the center of the table. And so if that means uplifting, like we did a story on the, like the appropriation of Dalit music in Bollywood. We did a story on from a very famous Dalit activist and scholar, um, Suraj Yangbe, on what does it mean to be an Ambedkarite in 2021? And it's important to hear from people telling their own stories. And we do not ever say that we've encompassed it all. And we invite people to share, share more nuance all the time. So I don't know if that helped answer it, but yeah, I think we think about a lot. That's fascinating. I always love to hear that people are taking a stand against italicizing non-English non words or American words. It's always great to hear. Um, I think we have a question for just one more question. Um, and then I have one to wrap us up at the end of the hour. Uh, this question is from Kaiti, and apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. It is, how do you think white people can and or should participate in the home spaces that we create, often in order to escape white dominance? Can I ask Lawrence, can I ask you to and we haven't heard from you in the Q and A. Do you mind answering this one? No, I don't mind at all. I think it's a great question. It feels ever, ever pertinent. Maybe especially pressing in like this long anti anti Asian moment where lots of liberal and progressive white folks are asking how they can be better allies or. Um, accomplices or various other terms and how they can support Asian Americans and that includes um, being in our home spaces at times or um, you know it and it, it is a delicate balance I think of wanting not 
the entire burden of pushing back against um, racism and the other violences striating our existences to fall on our own shoulders or on BIPOC shoulders. And we want white folks to take up that work and to bear responsibility, but balanced um, with the kind of histories of a violence that we're talking about and that sometimes well-meaningness um, violates spaces that need to not have white folks in them. Um, or spaces that that need to be separate, um, and so I think it's it's with a lot of care and patience and recognition of these histories of harm. Um, I think it's also something at the Smithsonian we think about a lot because um, we are always creating within a, a, a platform of like a gazillion tourists coming in through the through DC, um, but like you know majority white audiences, and so what does it mean? Like you know we create and, and, and support and do work that engages Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. But the reality is that because of the platform of the Smithsonian, there are always going to be predominantly white audiences coming through our spaces or attending our programs. And that that audience makeup means the kind of, some of what's in that question is something we are constantly grappling with is what does it mean to bring Asian American and Pacific Islander artists and audiences into spaces with white folks? Um, how do we grapple with that question for the white folks that might not be thinking about it already, but need to be thinking about it? Um, I think like this, like how we are coming to adopt land acknowledgement practices more broadly and asking people to kind of think about their positionality in a broader sense, starting with land acknowledgements, but extending quite a bit beyond that and, and understanding um, their own privileges and the, the kind of layers of difference. Um, and, and that includes when your presence causes harm, even if it, you don't mean it to. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for this answer. Um, I am aware that we are at the end of the hour. I want to do just a very, very rapid fire round. We love to end these events just with sort of recommendations, which I always call just kind of calling absent friends into this space. I'd love to hear from all of you, just other organizations our audience should look into, other publications, are there, are there writers, are there artist collectives that you love and, and wanna make sure that our audience is following? Um, Jafreen, can I start with you and I'll do a circle? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> um, everybody in this conversation. So let's start with all of us here. It would have been the first at my list. Um, I think I, one thing that has come out of the kind of the COVID era that I've really loved is um, um, readings and performances that people are hosting in their own backyards, in their neighborhoods. Um, Hala Alian has been doing some like backyard readings. Um, there, uh, the Royal Bengal Tea House has been doing like Bangladeshi musical performances throughout New York City. Um, there's a lot of these kind of pop-up performance readings and spaces um, that were initially kept small because of, you know, for COVID restrictions and, and, and being safe, but um, the result has been just these really beautifully intimate, creative evenings. Um, so I would say, you know, look into your own neighborhood. I'm sure um, there is a backyard reading or performance somewhere just waiting for you to attend. I love that. Um, Sningda, I know you need to run. So would you mind going next? Thank I'm you. so sorry, team. This coffee shop is closing, but I, I second everything Jacqueline said. But what I would just say is a general uh, exhortation, which is whatever your sphere of influence is and whatever you are so able go after it. So if you have the monetary means to support Asian American writers, purchase their books, pre-order them, support nonprofits like AWW, go get a Juggernaut subscription, go visit the Smithsonian and help donate to their Asian American arts, you know, do whatever you can. But if that's, if mon money is not it, do what you can. So if it's like connecting one person to another, if it's, you know, amplifying another voice, that's my only exhortation, which is we all have spheres of influence. So let's go get after it and help uplift each other. Thank you so much. Um, Lawrence, I ask you to go next. Yeah, I'll just name a couple of orgs. Um, Kearney Street Workshop, along with 
AWW is one of, you know, our oldest, most vener venerable community-based institutions. And so, especially if you're on the West Coast, you should look up Kearney Street. Um, the Hmong American Writers Circle is um, an important org. Um, let's see, there is, um, what's the, Kathy, what's the, what's the Cambodian American um, lit org that um, Sokan Terry runs. We should we should shout them out too. Yeah, but it's basically a combination of those words. Cambodian American Literary Arts Association. Cool. Shout out to them. Um, Pacific Tongues too. Yeah. For our for our Pacific Islander brothers and sisters and non-binary friends. Thank you. And Kathy, to round us out, some recommendations. Um, so certainly um, Kaya Press uh, out of Los Angeles. They've been around for a while. Um, yes, there's Mizna, um, which is um, for Arab arts. You have um, Rawi, uh, Radius of Arab American Writers. Um, we have um, as well, uh, did want to give a shout out to Youth Speaks, um, Youth Speaks Seattle. Um, and, um, you know, organizations that just serve youth in general, I think about in New York City, Urban Word. Um, and just, Yes, beautiful other organizations being listed in the chat. So those are some, but there are so many recommendations one might have. Um, I'll drop a, I have um, a link to just orgs that serve people of color that we have compiled in the past. Uh, I'll just drop that in the chat. Amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you all. We are officially at the end of our hour, at the end of our event. Um, we will keep the Zoom open for another couple of minutes and play a little bit more music. Um, so if any recommendations, other organizations come to mind, please do drop them in the chat. Um, stick around and, and say hi to our panelists if you are able to. Um, I want to make sure to give just a huge shout out, huge thanks to Chris and Sarika, our ASL interpreters from Pro Bono ASL, who are absolutely amazing. Thank you both so much for helping make our event accessible. Um, and of course, thank you to Jafreen, Lawrence, Nigda, who unfortunately had to run, um, and Kathy for guiding us so generously through this incredible conversation. Um, I want to kind of leave all of us, and I hope we can kind of step away from our computers with this idea that Lawrence posed, that we are all capable of being founders. I think that's at the heart of what we wanted to discuss today and just puts it so beautifully. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Take care, everybody. And we will see you soon, hopefully in person someday soon. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.